Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And really a program we've been looking forward to for quite a while, Virtual Voices of the Game. We're going to have a chance to talk to really one of the legendary figures in baseball history. Uh, this year's recipient of the Ford C. Frick Award for Broadcasting Excellence, longtime Chicago White Sox broadcaster for more than three decades. Pretty good player in his own right, too. 1968 was named the Sporting News Comeback Player of the Year. We're very glad to have with us uh, uh, broadcasting uh, from his home in Granger, Indiana. Joining us here in Cooperstown via Zoom, it's uh, our virtual voices of the game. Our guest, Ken Hawk Harrelson. Hawk, welcome to the program. Congratulations, by the way, on winning the Ford C. Frick Award. Uh, we hope you've been doing well these last few months. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, we've been trying to, you know, abide by the rules and stay safe, so to speak, and stay in the house as much as uh, possible. And when we do go out, you know, wear a mask and everything, because it's uh, none of us have ever seen anything like this. So it's been quite dramatic. Certainly has had an effect on baseball and the Hall of Fame. We had to postpone this year's induction. So you have some extra time to work on your, your speech uh, next year, Hall of Fame weekend, 2021. Have you been doing anything with the speech or are you gonna, putting that aside, waiting a while on that? No, I'm gonna get some help with it from uh, the guy who wrote my book, uh, Jeff Snook, who's a terrific writer. And yeah, I, you know what, Bruce, I have. At, at night, sometimes I, I've dreamed about it, what I was gonna say. And I also thought about uh, Jimmy, uh, Jim Tomey, when he actually, when he was going in, he, he went to Cooperstown early, with, you know, to practice his speech from the podium there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Cooperstown is, you know, something that everybody dreams about as a youngster and everything else. And so uh, I know I'm going to burn Euchre's behind, I can tell you that. <laughs> If you can do a speech half as good as Euchre's, you're going to be in great shape next year. Oh, Euchre, he's great. He's, you know, I'll tell you, he is indeed Mr. Baseball. Yeah. His speech uh, has got to be top two or three in Hall of Fame history. Uh, so funny, uh, so willing to poke fun at himself. And um, you'll bring some of those same qualities to the table, I'm sure. Hawk, I want to go back to your earliest days. You were born in South Carolina, but at a young age, you and your family moved to Savannah, Georgia, great town. Now I understand that, at least I've read this, that Rocky Calavito was your boyhood idol. Is that true? And if so, why'd you pick the rock? What was it about him that you liked? Well, actually uh, he was my mom's favorite player. And my favorite player was uh, at that time was uh, Mickey Mantle. Okay. And uh, then when I had a chance to play with Rocky, we were in Kansas City. I, uh, I could, he, he's just a wonderful person. I mean, and uh, he was a hell of a player, but he was, he was a better person. And uh, he taught me a lot of things. Uh, he was the kind of guy like Al Kaline. Al Kaline was my first idol in, in the American League because I loved the way he played. He gave you 100% every day. If he hit a little pop up to the infield, he busted his behind down the line. If he had a little one hopper back to the pitcher, he busted his behind down the line. And as a young player, if you can't learn something from that, then shame on you, because this is the way the game is supposed to play. It's Rocky. You know, Rocky, when we were in Kansas City, if we had one of our young, because it was a young team, if we had one of our young players who popped it up to the infield and just dogged it down the line or took the immediate right back to the dugout, Boy, when he got to the dugout, Rocky was waiting on him. Mm. And he absolutely, he'd grab him by the shoulder, grab him by the neck and say, if you ever do that again, I'm going to kick you behind because you're embarrassing me, you're embarrassing the team, and you're embarrassing yourself. And that was it. We took we used to take care of that stuff ourselves. The managers didn't have to do it. And, of course, the game has changed today. And, and over the years, you know, I've been in this game parts of uh, eight decades now. I think there are only about six guys who are in that club. And, and watching the evolution of the game of baseball, which is the most beautiful game. Uh, I played football, basketball, baseball, golf, everything. And baseball is the most beautiful game because there are no experts in the game of baseball. That's the beauty of the game. There have just been some guys who were around it longer than others and maybe saw a few things 
uh, that other guys haven't seen. But, uh, you know, people say, Hawk, you've been in the game a long time. You're an expert. And I tell them I'm not an expert. I said, there are no experts in this game because the game is, is larger. It's just so beautiful. And, uh, and I see things every week or two that I've never seen before. And you see that the evolution of the players today, Bruce, you know, the players today, uh, we have a huge influx of Latins and I'm very partial to Latins always have been and very partial to blacks because I understood I grew up in, in Woodruff and, and, and in Savannah. And those guys were my buddies because we lived in that, that area and we used to play football together, basketball together, baseball together. And, and then of course, Jackie Robinson came along and he just changed the culture of our society and certainly the culture of baseball. But to watch these guys today, uh, our superstars back in those days would be, would be superstars today. You know, your Mantle, your Mays, your Musials, Ted Williams, and these guys. And they'd be superstars 100 years from now. But the thing about it is, is that I was just a tick better than average major league player. And these guys who are a tick better than average major league players today are so much better than we were. It's not even funny. And these Latins, I'll tell you what, they have fun. They have fun. You know, they, Bruce, they grew up under a different culture down there on the islands. They don't go through analytics. They don't go through swing angles. They see ball, they hit ball. And if you'll notice when you're watching replays in a game, the guys who have the most fun and laugh the most are Latins. They enjoy playing the game. Our guys, our, our guys, our American kids come up under a different set of rules or codes, so to speak. And it's one of, uh, you know, mechanics, swing angles. And, uh, and uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, subscri subscribe to that at all because of the fact they, they are being taken from them. One of the biggest assets you can have as a major league player or, or a player period. And that's their childlike qualities. Mm. The more you think about mechanics, the more you think about something mechanical at the plate, the less instincts you have, the less childlike qualities you have. And my first rule to our two grandsons is one thing. First of all, play hard and then have fun. Don't worry about what's going on with your hands behind the plate. Worry about what the hands are going to do at the plate and then through the ball. Just have fun, you know. And uh, these kids today, some of them are driven away because these coaches that's what they read about and that's what they're going to subscribe to and teach. And if that, that's the case, then you take a lot of that childlike quality out of a child. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's not good. Well, certainly when you played and when you broadcast, you had a lot of fun. Calavito was known as a fun loving player. He was very good with the media, very outgoing with the fans. You mentioned that he was your mother's favorite player. And I know you were very close to your mother. Yes. Uh, when she found out that he was your teammate in Kansas City, I bet she was more excited than you. Well, she was. And, and I had uh, we had a party one night, team party that Rocky, we had the, he we had a young team and he had all the young players out there and he picked up the tab. It was a pretty good tab, mm -hmm. too. And uh, so I had I said, Rocky, you got to do me a favor. I said, you were my mom's favorite player. I'm going to call her. Will you talk to her? He said, sure. So I got her on the phone. Rocky talked to her for about 15 minutes. And she was just ecstatic, you know, and Rocky taught me a great lesson. One of the best lessons that anybody ever taught me. And that was we, at the time I was platooning. And uh, so we were playing the Yankees. And that's really the only time in Kansas City that we had a lot of fans in the stands uh, was when we had the Yankees in town. So uh, people didn't come to see us. They came to see the Yankees. They come to see the Mickey Mantles, the Whitey Fords, you know, the Billy Martins, the Elston Howards and, and Tony Kubex. So it was one of those things that uh, uh, I wasn't going to play and I, they were going to pitch Whitey Ford that night. And uh, they made a change, or excuse me, they were going to pitch Jim Coates that night, who was a hard torn right-hander. And they made a change. And I went out and played 27 holes of golf that day with Ted Mosfield. And we played uh, Sammy Esposito and Gino Samoli. We played them like a $25 Nassau because back in those days, the minimum salary was $6,000. In fact, in my first two years in the major leagues, I made more money playing golf, shooting pool and arm wrestling than I play, did playing major league baseball. <laughs> and so uh, Whitey was pitching first time I went to the plate. I remembered I had a blister on my uh, 
uh, ring finger on my left hand. And I remembered I had my golf glove up in my jeans because I went right from the golf course to the ballpark because we played 27 holes. And I had a blister there. So during batting practice, I, I got my golf glove out. And then the first time I came to the plate, uh, Whitey hung me a curveball and I hit it right over that 421 sign. But when I came out of the dugout with that flaming red golf glove, boy, the Yankees were all over me because nobody wore gloves back in those days. They, I can't tell you the names they were calling me. So anyway, I had another one later on in the game. And the next day, uh, all the Yankees came out of the dugout of their clubhouse, and they all had red flaming golf gloves on. Red Mickey had the, guy, the clubhouse guy go out and buy a couple of dozen. But the point being is that after that game was over, I had scheduled to do go, go to a party, and I walked right out the door in the Kansas City uh, clubhouse. It was right there where the fan. Once you opened that clubhouse door, the fans were there. There wasn't any five or six foot, you know, distance. And I'm pushing kids away. I don't want. I, I want to get some place. All of a sudden, somebody grabbed me by the neck and pulled me back in the clubhouse. And I was getting ready. I turned around. I was getting ready to hit him. And it was Rocky. And he said, let me tell you something, Hawk. He said, one of these days, you got a chance to be a hell of a player. But these are the people that pay our salaries. And these are the kids that come to the game and adore players. If you, if I ever see you push another kid away or you do this, I'm going to kick your butt. And you know, Rocky could. But he was a tough dude. Yeah. That was a great lesson because from there on, I never turned down an autograph. Now, I wasn't as good as Arnold Palmer. I'm, Arnold and I butted heads for 40 years. And I never, in those 40 years, I never saw Arnold refuse an autograph or I never saw him refuse a picture. Mm. And Rocky was like that. Rocky would stand there. And then when I was with Boston and having some, you know, big years, uh, sometimes there would be two or 300 people waiting outside, you know, to see the Hulk. And I would wait in the clubhouse probably an hour longer than everybody else to let the crowd, you know, disperse. And I'd go out there and there'd be 100, 200 people. And because of Rocky, I would sign every one of those autographs. And to this day, I still get fan mail from some of the older people, of course, right now, and thanking me for signing their autograph, you know. And that's the way Rocky was. And Cal Ripken was the same way. Cal Ripken, I never saw him refuse the autographs. He, there are some guys today, you know, when, when these kids, and I don't blame these kids. I don't blame these kids because of the fact this is what they are brought up with. Uh, you know, when I played, if you walked into a clubhouse after the game, you knew who won that ball game or you knew who lost that ball game. Today, you walk in the clubhouse and you don't know who won or lost because they're on their iPads, they're on their iPhones, they're playing games and everything else. So, and again, this is what they know. And uh, it's just one of these things that uh, uh, I feel sorry for them because they, except for the Latins, they still have fun. But uh, they wanted to see what the Hawks said about that play, the Hawks said about this play. Mm -hmm. In fact, Conerica was on this show and he was saying, we used to sit there and there'd be an unusual play or a bad call by an umpire. And they would say, I wonder what Hawks gonna say about that. You know? But, uh, you know, I had two rules, two rules of the game of baseball. First rule is you gotta catch the ball. That's the most important thing about the game of baseball. You can't give the other team 30 outs when you're getting 27 because in major leagues, they're going to beat you. And that's the first rule is catch the ball. And the second rule in baseball is don't mess with Joe West. <laughs> good advice. Good advice. Hawk, we have a great picture up on the screen. Your early days, you got the short hair with the Kansas City A's. You're playing first base. You have the first baseman's mid. It's got the fabulous Hawk, uh, your nickname on there, or your extended nickname. We add fabulous to it. That's a nickname that came to you from one of your Kansas City A's teammates. And it's a guy that some fans will be familiar with, Dick Hauser, who became a great manager. I always thought of Dick Hauser as a mild-mannered guy, but apparently when he gave you this nickname, it was not for the best of reasons. He gave you a hard time. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was in winter ball and I, you know, I'd signed for a big bonus and I had a lot of ink coming into uh, winter ball. So I was in a funk and I was really not swinging the bat very well at all. 
And there was a cartoon character that back in those days called Henrietta Hawk. So I struck out about three or four times in that game over in the shower. And, and he, had been, he had been calling me Henrietta uh, for about a week or so. And I was in no mood uh, to hear that again. So we're in the shower and he said something about calling me Henrietta Hawk. And I went over to him and I said, Slick, let me tell you something. I call him Slick. Uh, he was not a mild mannered guy. He was a feisty. He was like Jim Leland. He was those two guys had the same kind of personalities, about the same size and the whole bit. And I said, if you do that one more time, I said, I'm going to lay you out. So we said, well, maybe if you get a hit every now and then, I'll drop the Henrietta. So don't you know the next day we were playing the, the Giants and I hit uh, a home. Uh, in fact, I hit two home runs in that game. And we're in the shower after the game. And he said, OK, no more Henrietta Hawk. <laughs> so yeah you know, hawk stuck uh, stuck and he became a very important uh, person in my life because of the fact i talked to a, a psychologist and he has said that this is very common with athletes that you have an, an alter ego because bruce the biggest performance killer is pressure mm. you've got to find a way to alleviate the pressure and when i when after i found out about the hawk and everything and we became good buddies uh i would put all the pressure on him. You know, I'd be on the on deck circle, the ass would be at the plate, and it'd be a man at third base or whatever, a couple guys on, and the ass would uh, pop up or something, which he didn't do very often with men on base. He always hit the ball hard and got bases, but I would say, okay, Hawk, let's go. Do something. We got to do something. And that, that took the weight off my shoulders. That was the way I found a way to alleviate the pressure. And after that, we became pretty good uh, tandem. We became a pretty good hitter, you know, mm. in 68, uh, leading the major leagues and RBIs. And of course, uh, you can't do that unless you, you've got protection behind you, which I did. And uh, in fact, MLB did this, this documentary on me and Bruce Cornblatt was the uh, producer and he did a really a good job. And they came to our home here in Granger and they set up and we did this thing. We we're talking about the 67 uh, Red Sox and the impossible dream uh, because they had finished ninth the year before. So he's talking, so we do the, 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 the filming and after the filming was over there breaking down the cameras and Bruce looked at me and he said, oh, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. He said, you know, you've been sitting there for the last 30, 45 minutes talking about what a great pressure hitter pressure player that Carl Yastrzemski was. I said, yeah. He said, you hit behind him, right? I said, yeah. He said, why don't they keep pitching to him? <laughs> I said, I don't know, Bruce. I said, I'll tell you what I thought that many times. I said, these managers got to be dumb. <laughs> In fact, we, the last two games we had to win against Minnesota on a Saturday and a Sunday. Yeah. And that, in those games, he went six for seven. Wow. To this day, he's the best pressure. He's the best clutch hitter I've ever seen to this day. So by creating this alter ego, it's almost like you dehumanize the situation. You made it less personal and that took some of the pressure away. Is that how it worked for you? Yeah, yeah, it did. It, and the same thing in, in, uh, in golf, I, I, in golf, I had the, the, the talent. The talent was not an issue but I had a very bad temper and I tried to get Hawk to come out and, and tame that. Mm. And for some reason, occasionally he would. And then most of the time he wouldn't. So I think he was really disappointed in me. And uh, to this day, I still talk to him. You know, we live in Granger. We live 96 miles to my parking spot at the ballpark uh, at, uh, at uh, Guaranteed Rate Field in Chicago. And during that time, I had a, I have a lot of time to think you know, in that hour and a half drive, because I don't drive fast like Ed Farmer. It's an hour drive for Ed Farmer. It was an hour and a half drive for me. Mm. And, and uh, we talk things over and then we talk about our ball club. And he's, as I said, he, people think that this is, this is crazy, but is this, is uh, Dick Schwartz, who is the psychologist I talked to is world, world renowned. He took lectures all over the world. And he's the one that told me, he said, it's very common, as I mentioned earlier, it's very common that ball players have or athletes have an alter ego. Mm. And that's where they go when things get tough. 
if we were to just talk about ego, we could talk about Charlie Finley, and you had firsthand knowledge of him. There was an incident in 1967. He disciplined one of the players, pitcher Lou Kraus, for somewhat nebulous reasons. The players were not happy. Alvin Dark, the manager, came out in support of Kraus and the other players. I know that you and Alvin got along very well. Now, you were quoted as calling Finley a menace to baseball, but I think you said that wasn't true. You didn't really say that, but Finley thought you did, and he ended up releasing you, and you became essentially a free agent. And you look back at that incident, did you ever talk to Charlie face-to-face, -face, or was this all done through the media and through other channels? Well, I talked to him face-to-face -face, uh, years later after I'd uh, gone to Boston, and they set us beside each other at this this is a sports bank what they had uh, up in uh, northern Indiana. And uh, Charlie Finley was a bleep. That's <laughs> excuse my language. He, that's what he was. And players and players uh, are now starting to come out and say it. But when he fired Alvin, nobody was talking about anything. And finally, uh, Mike Hershberger was my roommate. And we were in Washington and we were going after the game to Baltimore. And so uh, we got to the Baltimore, uh, Lord Baltimore Hotel there. And I, I left word, no phone calls. And so about early in the morning, about 7.30, 7.45, the phone rings. And I know it, who it is. It's Charlie. So sure enough, I pick up the phone. I said, hello. He says, son. He says, hadn't I been like a father to you? And I said, no, Mr. Finley, you have not. And uh, at the time, I was making $12,000. And... So he said, uh, I've, I've fixed up a press conference there at noon at the Lord Baltimore Hotel, and I want a retraction of everything you said. And I said, Mr. Finley, I'm not going to retract one word I said. And he said, well, he started cussing at me then. And I said, wait a minute, Mr. Finley. I said, we both know that if you were standing right here, you wouldn't be saying these things. He said, well, what do you want your release? And I said, no, I don't want my release because we knew that was going to be a good ball club. I mean, a good ball club. I was the first. Dick Green was the second. Burt Campaneras was the short. Sal Bandit was the third. Joe Rudy was in left. Rick Mundy was in center. Reggie Jackson was in right. And we had some good arms, you know, good young arms of pitching. And so uh, when I said that, he said, I'll call you back in a half an hour. Slam so down the phone. So he calls me back about 20 minutes later. He says, as of this moment, you are no longer a member of the green and gold. Hmm. And he slammed down the phone. So Hershberger said, what'd he say, Hawk? I said, he just released me. And Mike said, <coughs> excuse me, Mike says, you lucky son of a gun. Because at the time I was really swinging the bat well. So I called Joe Reichler, who's the, the uh, guy in New York and a great guy. And I said, Joe, what's going on here? He said, man, you and Charlie must've had a big argument. I said, yeah, we did. He said, I gotta tell you this, he said, he puts you up on irrevocable waivers. And I didn't know what that meant, you know. I said, what does that mean, Joe? He said, that means this. He said, that means that you are the only person that can take you off these waivers. You're the only guy. He can't do it any, anything else. And he said, I know you're not going to do that. And boy, when he said, I know you're not, I'm not a smart guy, but he said, well, I know you're not going to do that. That rung a bell in my head. So we hung up the phone and about... Four minutes later, the White Sox called. Ed Short was the uh, general manager. And he said, Hawk, I understand you and Charlie had an argument. I said, yeah. He said, look, I got Eddie Stank with we right here. And this is what, in 67 when they call that the greatest pennant race in baseball history. You had four teams. You had the White Sox, the Red Sox, the Twins, and the Tigers, uh, all within one game of each other going down the stretch. And he said, I got Eddie Stanky with me right here. He said, I want you to talk to him. So he gets Eddie on the phone and Eddie says, Hawk, he says, you know, we got the best pitching in this, in this, uh, these uh, contenders. I said, yeah, they, which they did. They had the best pitching. They couldn't score. He said, if you come over here, we can win this thing. And we talked for a few minutes and he gave the phone back to short. And he said, look, Hawk, he said, I'm not going to get into a bidding contest. He said, we're going to offer you a hundred thousand dollars to come here. And when he said bidding contest to go along with Joe Reichler saying, I know you're not going to do that. That rung another bell in my hand because I didn't know, you know, we didn't have agents back in those days. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't know the position I was in. 
So when the phone kept ringing and ringing, everybody, even the Tokyo Giants called and offered me triple what my best offer would be if I could sign a three-year contract with them, which I wasn't going to do that. Red Sox called, Haywood Sullivan said, I'm flying down to Baltimore tonight. I want to meet you at the airport. So we'd met, blah, 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 blah. He offered me 118,000. Uh, and then uh, from the Red Sox, and I accepted because I liked hitting in Fenway Park. So now I go home back to Kansas City. And it was funny because the, that the next night, that was the first game between the uh, AFL and the, and the NFL. Probably it was a you know exhibition game. Kansas City was playing the Chicago Bulls. So I go to sleep that night and I'm feeling good because I got $118,000, uh, you know, in my pocket, so to speak. And the next morning, uh, Paul Richards called from the Atlanta Braves and he, uh, he said, what you've been offered. And Paul and I were close. We we're good golfing buddies. Uh, Alvin Dark, Gene Mock and Paul and myself played a lot of golf together. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I've been offered 118,000. He said, well, I'm gonna give you 125,000 to come down here for our Braves because they were in a pennant race too. And I said, look, I, I want to go. I want to go to Boston. He said, I want you to come down here. So I like Paul very much. And I said, OK, so I got to call the Red Sox. So I call the Red Sox back. And I told him, I said, I got to go to Atlanta. I said, uh, Paul Richards offered me 125,000. And Sully said, well, we can't go that high. So I go to sleep that night. The next morning, the phone rings. It's Dick O'Connell, who was uh, vice pre or president of baseball operations and general manager of the Red Sox. He said, what's it going to take to get you up here to Boston? I said, 150,000. He says, you got it, just like that. <laughs> if I'd have said 200,000, he'd have said, you got it. And this <laughs> went on and on and on. Finally, <clears throat> I signed with the Red Sox. And of course, I called Alvin and I asked him, I said, what do you think is going to happen, Alvin? Because Alvin had a brilliant baseball mind. And he said, I'll tell you what's going to happen, Kenneth. He said, I think what's going to happen is, he said, whoever you sign with, is probably going to win the pennant. Mm. And he said, I think you're going to get at least 150,000. And that's exactly what happened. I got 150,000 from Boston and I went to the, there to the Red Sox and we won the pennant. So I should say, yeah, it's won the pennant. I call him the Renaissance man. You had some important RBIs though. You drove in a run in the, the clinching game uh, very late in the season. It's one of the Maybe the greatest pennant race, pure pennant race we've ever seen in baseball history. And now your first opportunity to play in the World Series. As you look back at that first experience in the Fall Classic, was it nerve wracking? Was it enjoyable? Or was it both? It was both, uh, especially when you got to face Bob Gibson. <laughs> you know, he, he was pretty good. In fact, he beat us three times in that series. And, uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. In the seventh game, uh, Yaz popped up, and I, uh, now there's uh, there was uh, a man on, and Yaz popped up, and I go to the plate. And the first pitch Gibby threw me was a sinker. So I backed out of the box, and I'm thinking to myself, I said, oh, I said, this guy don't throw sinkers. So now I get back in the box. Here's another sinker. Now I strike two. And then he threw me that wicked slider, one of the best sliders I've ever seen. And he struck me out. And so I'm going back to the dugout. Rico, Rico Petroselli was the next hitter. And I said, Rico, has lost his fastball. He had pitched like, you know, 300 and something innings that year. I think he had 28 complete games or something. I don't know how many, but, you know, they don't have 28 complete games in all the major leagues these days. So he said, what? I said, he's lost his fastball. Sure enough, Bob Gibson had, he was tired. Here he is in the seventh game of the World Series, and he would not allow himself to get beat. Mm. And he stuck it up our behinds with that sinker and slider and, and won the third game in the seventh game of the World Series. And uh, I wanted to call Gibby a couple of months ago. And, of course, he just passed away recently. But I wanted to call him and, and just tell him, because I hated it, Bob Gibson. Everybody hated him, you know, because he beat you. Yeah. And... I wanted to call him, just tell him how much respect I had for him. And I didn't do it. And I'm kicking myself in the behind right now when I read that, you know, he had passed away because what a, he and guys like Drysdale, you know, and Koufax and, and on and on, Marshall, 
these guys, they were the, Don was actually, Pitt Drysdale was a symbol of pitching because he never missed a start. You know, in fact, he pitched, he pitched, I uh, forget what year it was, with a broken hand, a broken right hand. He got, he hit uh, Frank Howard at a party one night. And of course it didn't hurt Frank, <laughs> <laughs> but he broke his hand and he never missed a start. And that, that was uh, being around these guys and playing against these guys. And then of course in the all-star game, I faced the Drysdale and the first pitch he threw me was that slippery elm, you know, and it went down about a foot and a half, just about five feet in front of home plate. And I backed out of the box and, and I had never seen that before. Mm. I'd heard about it. So I get back in there. He throws me another one. Now it's 0-2 and, and I back out. And so I, Drysdale looked in and he had to put his glove up over his face because he was laughing because he knew I'd never seen anything like that. <laughs> then he hung me a slider and I, and I popped it up uh, to Willie Mays. But uh, it, it's just been such a, I tell you what, it's just been a great ride in my, in my baseball career. I had fun playing. I played hard. And, uh, and that's what, that's why I've changed my philosophy over the years uh, because the game has changed. The mark of a good manager today is not wins and losses. The mark of a good manager today is how hard do those players play for him? Mm. Because he can only play with what he's got. And if the general manager doesn't give him the ammo, so to speak, then he's not going to win. But if you're not going to win, you still play hard. And that's what, that's what good managers do. Anytime you see a team that busts their behinds and you know, they got a good manager. Buck, you mentioned all the great pitching of that era and it all conspires along with ballpark conditions and the way the rules were 1968 is the year of the pitcher. Yet you're one of the few hitters that didn't seem to be affected. You got better. You finish third in the American League MVP race. You win the Sporting News Comeback Player of the Year. 35 home runs, 109 RBIs. You batted in the 270s. You had a high on base percentage. I mean, it was your best season. You elevated your game despite the year of the pitcher conditions. Why do you think it all came together for you that year? How did that occur? A couple of reasons, Bruce. First of all, I was a good fastball hitter. And to this day, you know, people say, um, you know, they'll write me a letter, say my son can't hit the curveball. And if it's well composed and everything, they leave the phone number. Sometimes I'll call them back and I, I, I tell them, don't worry about it because I can't name you five good breaking ball hitters. You know, unless they hang them, of course, and now it's a cookie. But uh, that being the case, and also I had uh, Frank Howard finished second to me uh, uh, in the American League, Willie McCovey. Led the National League. I had I beat him by three RBIs. Uh, he had 106 and I had 109. But for, if Frank Howard had been on that Boston Red Sox team, and Frank drove in 105 that year, uh, he had driven in 150 because he didn't have anything in front of him with Washington, and he didn't have anything behind him. And it's the court circumstances, you know, dictate a lot of things. The ballpark you play in, the protection that you have, because you can protect a guy from in front too, as well as you can from behind. And I had, you know, I had uh, Reggie Smith and Yastrzemski in front of me, and I had uh, Rico Petroselli and George Scott and those guys behind me. So I was going to get some good pitches to hit. It's just that simple. Now, you still got to hit them, but at least I walked into that batter's box I mean, that's what I tell kids today. You walk into that batter's box, that batter's box is yours. You can go anywhere in that batter's box you want. And Pete Rose was talking about this and explaining it uh, on one of the post-game shows a year or two ago. And uh, he was 100% right, you know, evidenced and arguably, you know, uh, the most hits, I've, you know, they're ever in the history of the game. But he says you can stand anywhere in that box you want to go. You can stand in the back right-hand corner, the back middle, and the back inside. You can stand in the front uh, corner on the inside, front corner in the middle, and front corner on the outside. And I started moving around in the box. I didn't change my swing, you know. Uh, and, and being a good fastball hitter also with some of these pitchers out there, they, they thought that they could throw a foot quicker, you know, with the higher mound. And uh, of course, that was right into my wheelhouse there because I got a lot of fastballs. 
I never hit a good breaking ball, uh, maybe once or twice, but uh, the only good breaking balls that I ever, uh, no, only breaking balls I ever hit were hangers, you know, and you're going to get, if you've got enough patience and you've got a buddy with you, like I had Hawk, and, and you've got a sense of control, so to speak, when you step into that box, Ted Williams told me, Hawk, there's going to be a lot of days you step into that box and that guy 60 feet, six inches away is going to be better than you were that night. And you got to understand that because you could never realize your potential unless you understand how to take an 0 for 4. Now, that's pretty profound. And Ted was the greatest guy I ever talked to about hitting. He and I talked hitting, I mean, hours and hours. And uh, what a charismatic guy he was. He's the most charismatic athlete I've ever met. And uh, we were sitting around one night at, uh, at Bay Hill after a round of golf and and Arnold and uh, Dick Ferris and myself had played. And so Dick asked, asked me a pointed, he was Arnold's best friend. And he asked me a pointed question. And he said, Hawk, he says, you play with a lot of athletes that were really charismatic. He said, who's the most charismatic athlete that you've ever known? And he thought I was going to say Arnold. Mm -hmm. So I looked at Arnold and I pointed to Arnold. And I said, you're number two. And he said, what? I said, you're number two. He said, who's number one? I said, number nine. <laughs> that was Ted's number. <laughs> and he started laughing because he knew it. Arnold, was, Arnold knew a lot about baseball. Yeah. But Arnold, uh, Ted was the most charismatic guy I've ever been around. It was also in Boston that you started to gain some attention for your wardrobe. You were probably known at one point as the best dressed man in all of baseball. This, I believe, is the cover of the first book that was written about you, came out around 1969. Now, is this one of these famous Nehru jackets you're wearing? Well, this interview was going real good till you brought that up. <laughs> the Nehru jackets. <laughs> I bought one of every color, and that's the only one I got to wear before they went out of style. <laughs> you don't still have them? No, hell no. no. <laughs> you know, I had a party one night, and uh, I had this, I had a two bedroom apartment and one of the bedrooms we had made into a dressing room and there was all kinds of sweaters and pants and I had a chest of drawers there with you know and shirts and everything hanging in so we had this party and I went to bed that night and we had maybe 20 people over there and I woke up the next morning and all the neighbors were gone <laughs> they had taken them because <laughs> they all had some place on them they had hawk you know because I always had them uh, pants, shirts, everything. I always had Hawk put on there. <laughs> I got to say, I think you look pretty good here. I love the gold chain, uh, the pose, the hair. I, I think this is pretty stylish. I, I love it. I think it's great. Well, it was a lot of fun. And, and I realized, you know, Boston is, is just a great, uh, great sports town. And uh, it, at that time, you know, I love, I love, you know, Stremsky like a little brother. He, uh, he, he's just, in fact, I, he's the best player I ever played with or against. And uh, Al Kaline came into the booth a couple of years ago and we were talking and Yaz's name came up and, and Kaline said, I mentioned Yaz and Kaline said, he's the best, he's the greatest player I ever played against. Hmm. And, but Yaz was not a guy who was uh, favorable, so to speak, or loved the media, which Hawk did. Hawk loved the media and Boston needed a personality and Hawk understood that. And so I went along with him. And as it turned out, that's why we became, you know, one of the favorites there in Boston. In fact, there were some stories written that, that no Red Sox player had ever captured the town more than Hawk Harrelson. And it was because of him. I just let him, I just got, I just got out of his way and let him go. You know, and he was, he liked to dress fashionably and he liked to, you know, he had, he would never turn down an interview with the media, even after he'd struck out four times. So I realized that at an early age and, uh, and, 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 and obviously it paid off. Yeah. I know you were crushed when you were traded to the Cleveland Indians. Here we see you with your nickname on the back of the Jersey. You had some injury problems there. Ultimately, you decided to retire. Uh, I believe it was after the 1971 season. You were still very young. You were still only 29. Uh, you decide to play golf at, at that point. 
Um, why did you leave the game? Were you just physically not able to sustain the grind? Or did you just feel the challenge of golf was something that you needed to try? Well, all of that. But the big Riley Fingers is really the guy that caused me to retire because we were playing an exhibition game in Mesa. And, you know, in those days, the infields were like tarmac, like an airport runway, hard as a rock. And so Alvin had just told everybody that he wanted us to get close to the start of the season. And I want you to slide into second base all the time. So Riley got me 0-2 and, and he screwed around and walked me. So now I'm on first base and, and then uh, Max Alvis was the next hitter and Max hit a ground ball to Bando and Sal bobbled it a little bit and I was busting it down to second, but I saw the little bobble and, and all of a sudden I'm not going to slide. And then I remember what Alvin said and I started to slide and I heard a pow, pow. I knew my leg was broken, but I didn't know my uh, ankle was. So when I'm lying on the ground, I picked up my right leg and my foot was pointing down, mm. you know, it turned all the way around. And, uh, it was one of the worst, they say, one of the worst uh, breaks in the history of the game. So I, I flew back to Boston and, and got a guy named Dr. John McGillicuddy to, to operate. And uh, I asked him, uh, how long is this going to last? Because he had put it together back with epoxy, staples and screws, you know, mm -hmm. the ankle cover. And he said it should last at least 20 years. Well, that was what, over 50 years ago. <laughs> and they're still there. I still got the same staples and screws. Wow. And during that rehab time, Bruce, I just lost interest in playing. Yeah. I really did. I just lost interest in playing. And I wanted to try golf. And I did. As I said, I had the talent. That was not an issue. But I got $225,000 worth of canceled checks to prove I cannot play golf. I'd go out there and I'd go out with 14 and clubs and I'd come back with eight or 10 and you can't beat those guys with eight or 10 clubs. Uh, they're too good. I played a lot, you know, with uh, Arnold, as I said, 40 years, we played butted heads and played a lot of, a lot, a lot with Nicholas. And uh, I guess my best achievement, I won a lot of small tournaments, but I guess my best achievement was uh, uh, going over. We Arnold, Jack and I played down at Lagoras in Miami and we had been playing, this is 72 now. Yeah. Uh, so he was going for the Grand Slam that year. He had won the Masters and the U.S. Open. So we played, and I shot like 65 or 66 that day. So we're going to have a little lunch. And he said, Hawk, he says, you're going to go over and try to qualify for the Open. Mm. And I said, no. He said, well, you should. He said, you're playing too good. So I called my sponsor up, and I told him what Jack and he said. Well, if Jack said it, he says, you go over there and, and try to qualify. So I went over, and they were playing at Muirfield in uh, – in Edinburgh, right outside of Edinburgh. And uh, we, we qualified at the sister course called Ghislaine. And the, I'm not a good bad weather player. And it was cold, it was drizzling rain, and it was windy. And I'm a son of a gun. I didn't do it, Hawk did it. He shot 70, 68 to lead all American qualifiers. And uh, then uh, the tournaments that were there started on Wednesday because they didn't play on Sunday. So on, on Tuesday, I go to the <clears throat> practice tee and I'm hitting balls and now I'm going to go back to the hotel and Jack comes walking out of the clubhouse he says who are you playing with today and I said I'm not going to play today he said what I said I'm not going to play today why he goes why I said because I'm hitting it as good as I can hit it Jack and uh he said no 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 you're going to play the day before the tournament he says you're going to play with me he's come come on you and I are going to play Weisskopf and Yancey so if Jack says you're going to play with him, you play with him. So I have my caddy go back, bring the clubs back out. And we go to the first tee. And Jack told me walking over to the tee, because the first tee at, at Muirfield is a long way from the clubhouse. And he told me, he says, look, don't say anything about this. But I, I got a crick in my neck. He says, Barb and I were playing tennis last night. And I got this crick in my neck. And he can't turn. So we get out there. So they got the honors. And Yancey gets up, hits a little shot over in the right rough. And Weisskopf gets up and he just rips it down the gut. And Jack was sitting over there talking with all these media people. And there must have been, I don't know, 16, 20,000 people there because Jack was going for the slam. Mm. So he said, go ahead and hit. So I get up and I'm, I'm nervous. You know, like when you get in a fight, your knees are shaking and everything. And, and I just killed it on the same line as Weisskopf. And Jack gets up and he couldn't turn. So he had a little shot over there in the right rough. 
And we get down there and there's a ball here and there's a ball about 20, 25 yards on down there. Well, Weisskopf is over in the rough, you know, he's walking down the side over there and he's getting some yardage and he goes right to the front ball. So we get up to this ball and, and I look at it, I said, Jack, that's not mine. And he goes like this. He waits for about 10, 12 seconds. He goes, hey, Weiss, you gonna play today or not? He comes over, <laughs> See that, he comes storming back. And Jack had told me that he was playing so good. He said, they, you know, we played nine holes yesterday. He shot 30. We played uh, 18 the day before he shot 64. He said, and then he told me, he said, I just want to see the first time you knock it by him. He knew Weisskopf. So anyway, uh, we played and we played and, uh, and I played really, I hit it good. I had, I had six, three putts. I told him though, I told him, I said, Jack, I know you're going for the slam but I'm gonna to try to win this thing. And he looked at me, he smiled and he says, well, you should feel that way. Then all of a sudden he patted me on the shoulder and he goes, don't worry, you won't have that feeling long. <laughs> 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 and sure enough, Jack somehow made the cut. He made the cut and then he shoots 66 the last day and Trevino had two chip ins. He chipped in on, I think 14 and he chipped in on 17 to par five. And he beat Jack by one shot or else Jack would have, uh, you know, had the third leg of the, of the grand slam. But uh, he was a, Jack was a, as Arnold, he told me, he, Jack told me, he said the greatest competitor he ever played against was Arnold. He said the biggest, best ball striker he ever played against was Trevino. Really, great stuff. We're gonna continue with Hawk Harrelson, winner of this year's uh, Ford C. Frick Award. We do wanna mix in some of your questions as well. We still have to talk to Hawk about his broadcasting career. That's obviously a big part of this story. Uh, we do have a question in uh, from one of our viewers and it is about uh, broadcasting. It comes from Tom Isaacson. Uh, Hawk, thanks for the time, great content. I'm curious, how does a former player become a great broadcaster? Uh, who did you try to learn from as you made the transition to the booth? Well, there were several reasons, Bruce, as you well know, you're in the business. First thing is you gotta have uh, a good producer. You gotta have good people in the truck. Uh, it's gotta be well-planned. And then uh, the greatest advice that I've ever had about broadcasting uh, came from Kurt Gowdy and Howard Cosell. Hmm. Kurt Gowdy called me up after I'd been broadcasting. I started in 75 with the Red Sox broadcasting and he calls me up and he says, Hawk, I wanna talk to you. I'm coming to the ballpark tomorrow. I said, sure. And, you know, Kurt is a legend. Uh, so he comes to the ballpark. He said, look, I've been watching you. He says, you got a chance to be a good one, but I'm gonna give you the best advice you'll ever have. And I said, what's that? He says, don't try to please everybody because you can't. It's impossible, especially in a two team city. He said in, in Boston, in New York, virtually a two team city because of the close proximity and, and the rivalry. He says, you're gonna have people that are gonna crucify you and you're gonna have people that love you. So now about three weeks later, two and a half weeks later, Howard, coach calls up. He says, I want to come to the ballpark. I want to talk to you. So he comes in and we sit down and we're talking and he says, Hawk, he said, I've been watching it. He said, you got a chance to be a good one. He said, but I'm gonna give you the best piece of advice you'll ever have. It was, all, it was weird. It was eerie, Bruce. It was like, you know, uh, here's Kurt Gowdy and Howard Cole. And it was like, they read it from a script. Hmm. He said, the best piece of advice I'll ever give you is that don't try to please everybody because you can't. And he was right. Kurt was right. And especially in a two team city. And virtually I worked my whole 42 years behind the booth in two team city, Boston, New York. And then, uh, I, you know, in uh, Chicago with the White Sox and the Cubs. And I told Jason Bonetti, who came in and, and took my place, you know, and uh, it's play by play guy there. I told Jason the same thing. He asked me what I should think, what he should think about. I said, don't try to please everybody. I said, because you can't, it's impossible. So why you want to try to do something impossible? And that's what I used to tell all these youngsters, these aspiring young announcers who would write me letters and occasionally Bob Graham would, uh, they would call him and Bob Graham would, uh, if they sounded good, then Bob would ask him to come to the ballpark, bring him up to the booth and we'd talk for five or 10 minutes. And that's virtually what I told everyone. I said, be yourself and don't try to please everybody because you can't, especially in a two team city. It's just impossible. And uh, 
that was actually the best advice because Kurt told me, he said he did Rose Bowl one year. Uh, I think it was Ohio State and USC. And he said, after the game, he said, I got hundreds of letters from uh, USC fans crucifying me for being partial to Ohio State. And I got hundreds of letters from Ohio State fans crucifying me because I was partial to USC. He said, Hawk, that's when I knew it was a great broadcast. <laughs> yes. Very good. Now, this photo is from your early years with the Red Sox. I first remember you as a broadcaster with the Yankees in the mid to late 80s. I grew up as a Yankee fan in Yonkers, New York, and you were broadcasting for Sports Channel. And I, I thought you were terrific. You brought insights to the game that I had never heard before. You know, I'd grown up, grown up with Rizzuto and White and Messer, and they were all great in their own way. But you brought a different perspective and in some ways a little more of an inside baseball perspective. I'm just curious, your years with the Yankees, uh, how did you and the boss get along? Well, I had been a GM and, and with the White Sox and, uh, and George, you know, George was a bully. And, and uh, the first meeting we ever had, we went to the World Series in, in uh, 86 uh, or 85. When it was Can uh, when it was uh, St. Louis and uh, Kansas City, and anyway, we had a meeting with with Reinsdorf and Einhorn, George and myself, and so we were in there talking. It was a small room, and George was really upset at Killer Kane, who was a traveling sick, you know, and uh, because he made him do the reservation late, and there was nothing available. So we had a little small room that was sitting in there. In fact, I'm sitting on the bed. And we start talking and George is like, I'm not, he's, he's like, I'm not even there. He's talking with Reinsdorf. They're trying to do a deal. Uh, and all of a sudden uh, I said, George, and he turned and looked at me and I said, let me tell you something. I said, you want to talk about Jerry, uh, about finances and stuff like that? Great. I said, but if you want to talk about doing a deal, I said, I'm the general manager. You talk with me. Mm. And he looked at me like he was stunned a little bit. Then he looked at Jerry and Jerry just smiled. And that was the start. Uh, and then uh, we were doing a game in Seattle and Pinello was doing a great job managing that ball club. I think he only had one start or 10, 10 wins and they were hanging in there. So a friend of mine called me because we didn't have iPads and all that stuff that, back in those days. And he called me up and read this column that, that uh, I'm not, I know the writers now, I'm not gonna mention it, but. He was uh, uh, really ripping Pinella. And, and, and then that really upset me. Mm. So during the game, I just ripped George apart. I was telling him he ought to go get a truck and back up and take some of these pictures that he traded for and get them out of here. And I went on and on about it. So after the game was over, I called my wife, my beautiful Greek wife, Eris, and I said, honey, uh, I'm going to pack my clothes because she said, why? I said, because we're going to get fired. Mm. She said, what? I, and I told her what I said. So the next day I go to the ballpark, Yankee Stadium, to get my mail after we get home from Seattle. And uh, I'm getting ready to get on the elevator to go up. And George comes walking in. He had been on his farm down in Ocala. And he just looked at me. Then he turned. I was in the back of the elevator. He turned away from me. He was facing the front of the elevator. And we start to go up. And he said, Hawk, he said, I heard what you said about me yesterday. I said, yeah. He goes, you know, you might be right. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know yourself, you can't let a bully bully you. Yeah. And Pinello was, Lou is one of my dear friends. And uh, I'll tell you what, what a job he did. And Lou should be in the Hall of Fame. I think he Two years ago, I think he only missed by one vote, but uh, he, he should be in the Hall of Fame, not as a player, which he was really a good player. In fact, the two guys in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, that's how I judge hitters. Don't tell me what you hit. Tell me when you hit it. And in the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings, the two toughest outs in that Yankee lineup back in those days was Thurman Munson and Lou Pinella. Mm. Yeah. Hawk, if you ever write another book, it should be called, I Stood Up to the Bully, The Boss, and I Survived. That's, that's a great story. <laughs> I love it. 
Uh, you end up going back to the White Sox as a broadcaster, your second stint as uh, a member of their announcing team. I love this photo of you. It just shows your love of the game, the great time that you're having. You work with some really interesting people like Don Drysdale at first, uh, later Tom Pachorek, Wimpy, Darren Jackson, of course, Steve Stone uh, for many years. That leads into our uh, next question uh, that we have. Uh, one of our fans, and I forget her name, she wanted to know, who is your favorite broadcaster? Who is the person you really like to listen to? There are so many out there. There are so many out there, really. I guess if there's one guy that I really enjoy, and I, he put me right, you know, you're talking to Vince Scully was great, you know, the Ernie Harwell's, uh, you know, Tom Hamilton in Cleveland, Eric Nadell in Texas. I used to get to listen to him all these guys, so to speak, on my, you know, drive home because I lived in the Eastern zone. I worked in the central zone. And after a long game, sometimes I wouldn't get home till two, two thirty in the morning. And I had a chance on Sirius radio to listen to the West coast games, Ray Fossey out in Oakland. I love that. But I, I would have to say that my, without question, my favorite all time announcer, Don Drysdale. Mm. Don knew the game. He knew pitching. He was a good hitter. He knew base running. He knew positioning. He knew everything. And he was smart. Don was smart and he was tough. And I would say the second guy that put me right in the ballpark was Bob Euchre. I love I love to listen to him because if it's a bad, you know, the secret, one of the secrets to, to broadcasting is that if it's a one nothing, two, one, three, two game, we got people in the stands who could come up and, and broadcast those games because they take care of themselves, especially if you got a good director like Jim Angio I had for. Oh, you know, 33 years. He was one of the best. And and I used to tell Jimmy over my call switch, I said, Jimmy, go to work in those games because an announcer in a game like that, you don't have to say anything hardly. Let the pictures do the talking. And that's what Angio was so great at. And and Mike Leary now, who's working with the Marquee, you know, the Cub thing, he was a, he was a great producer. But if you get those guys, and you and, and, and Dick Stockton taught me a lot. You know, my, he was my first partner, you know, with the Red Sox in 75. And Dick, you know, was one of the great comprehensive announcers we've had in the last 50 years. You know, Bob Costa is probably the greatest comprehensive announcer we've ever had because he does, you know, football, basketball, baseball, and of course the Olympics. So I, I learned a lot from those guys. But Euchre, uh, if it was a bad ball game, you got to take care of those. And that's why Tommy, Wimpy was just great at that. If it was a bad ball game, if it was eight to one in the fifth inning, sixth inning, uh, and the game was going slow, I used to just lead Wimpy in, and then I'd sit out, lay out, and let him go. And he could take care of it. You know, he he was yeah, he has one of the greatest sense of humors. Uh, and and that's what Euchre does. If it's a good ball game, you know it's a good ball game just by the way Euchre delivers. And if it's a bad ball game, he's gonna make you laugh. Yeah, he's going to keep you interested in there and he's going to come out with some stories. And I've got some stories about Bob Euchre that you just in the speech next, uh, next year at, at Cooperstown. I'm going to wear his ass out. <laughs> just a couple more things, Hawk. Uh, one of our viewers today is a guy you might remember. He was a teammate of yours with the KCAs, infielder named Jimmy Driscoll. Oh, sure. Uh, Jimmy says, I was playing second base with the A's when Hawk broke his leg and ankle. So he was at that game and he was playing in the game. So Jimmy wanted to say hi to you, wanted to include that. That's great. Jimmy, little second baseman, left-handed hitter. I think he was yeah. Massachusetts. That's and right. uh, he, uh, great kid, great teammate. That was one thing about that club. That club had probably uh, the greatest chemistry of any team I've ever seen because, and that's evidenced by them leaving in 68 to go to Oakland. And they won five consecutive divisional titles and three consecutive world championships. Now, you're not gonna see that happen again. And as, as you are not gonna see John Schurholz and Bobby Cox down in Atlanta winning 14 consecutive uh, divisional titles. But that Oakland team had a great, you know, there was, when we were in Kansas City, there was a fight in the clubhouse almost every day between the guys, but you, you know, we could fight each other, but you couldn't, if you were on the opposing team, you touch one of my teammates or, and you're going to have everybody on your behind. And, uh, but Jimmy was uh, just a great teammate. 
Last question for Hawk. And obviously you've made news this year, winning the most prestigious award any baseball broadcaster can receive, the Ford C. Frick Award. What does it mean to you? What does this award mean to you? Are you nervous, even though it's a ways away from your speech next July? I mean, is this something that you're, you're thinking about every night? Is it consuming you? What are your thoughts about really reaching the top of baseball broadcasting? Well, when Tim Mead told me that I had won, uh, I could, that was one of the few times I've ever been speechless. And I was sitting on my couch there in Orlando and uh, my two surrogate sons, A.J. Przinsky and, and Robert Dameron, I didn't know they were there, but they were in the background because they knew that, I forget what time it was, uh, they were going to call. And it was either going to be yes or no, you know. So when, when, I, when I was speechless and we hung up the phone, with, I hung up the phone with Tim, uh, A.J. and, and uh, Robert and my son Casey, uh, they came running over and hugged me and everything else. And I had tears in my eyes. I'm, I'm a very emotional guy, Bruce. I mean, I, I you know, I, 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 I'm more, one of my favorite programs is America's Got Talent. Mm. And I'm telling you, when I watch that program and I cry, when you see these youngsters get up there, I mean, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and you hear the voices of them. And then all of a sudden they get the golden buzzer and here comes the family. That's an emotional moment. But as far as I'm concerned about winning the Ford Frick Award, I'll tell you, I, I, I love it. There's no doubt about that. But I'll tell you who I love it for. I love it for my beautiful wife, Eris, who saved my life. Uh, you know, when I met her, I had retired from baseball and I was going out at night and I was drinking too much and I was getting in too many fights. And you do that enough, you're going to get dead because you're going to run into the wrong guy one night. And uh we met and I knew that if I didn't stop that, I was going to lose her. So I stopped it. And that was uh, 47 years ago, we've been married. And then our two beautiful children, Krista and Casey. And now we have Casey's wife, Kate, and, uh, and our grandsons, Nico, Alexander, and Hank. And that's what, that's what I'm most proud of winning this award for. You know, Ford Frick has, is, is something because he was the commissioner when I first came into baseball in 1959. He was the third commissioner. There have been 10 commissioners of baseball. I've been through eight of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, for my family, it's just, I can't tell you how much I love it. It's just that I wanted to get into this club of being all the parts of eight decades in the game of baseball for them. That'd be, you know, my legacy. of uh, and Ford Frick won, won her, uh, my legacy to my grandkids so they will have something to talk about and they can come to Cooperstown and, and see a picture of this big old nose of mine. And, and I just love it. I mean, uh, it's, it's something, it's a lot, I'll, I'll tell you, put it this way. It's a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be mm. a lot bigger. I mean, people will stop me in the supermarket and say, congratulations, you know, on your Ford Frick award. And, and uh, I've heard from people that uh, I've gotten to where I text pretty much, you know, and, and the Dutchman, Bert Blylevin and I, by the way, uh, his wife, Gail was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer and, and she got a, she got a good bill of health because the doctor took the lump out and her lymph nodes were clear. So we prayed for her and, and uh, guys like that, you know, you make these uh, acquaintances and, and then, and, and all of a sudden, I'll get a call from friends of mine or whoever, and they'll say, uh, is this the Hall of Famer, Hawk Harrelson? <laughs> and of course, that'll knock you to your knees sometimes, you know. Well, Hawk, we look forward to meeting uh, you and all of your family when you come to Cooperstown next July. I want to say from a personal standpoint, uh, it's been a thrill and an honor for me to talk to you over this last hour. I've really enjoyed it. And sincere congratulations on a very deserving Ford C. Frick Award. Thank you, Hawk. Well, thanks to you, Bruce, and thanks to Stephanie, and thanks to Tiny, and thanks to everybody in the crew there. Uh, John, the Polak, <laughs> he and AJ are good friends. He told me you guys were good, and, and I can see you are. So thank you. Oh, we appreciate it, Hawk. Again, our guest, Ken Hawk Harrelson, 
a uh, fine major league player, legendary broadcaster, winner of this year's uh, Ford C. Frick Award, and he will be honored at next year's Hall of Fame induction weekend. We thank Hawk for being with us. We thank all of you for joining us as well. We hope you've enjoyed this last hour. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.